Today we are talking about praise and worship. Um, and, you know, these are two, two different things that we have here in Christianity. Praise can be a part of worship, but worship encompasses more than just praise. And so we're going to take, this can be a kind of a two-part sermon here. We're going to start out with praise. And when you look at the Old Testament, there's a few different words that are used to describe praise. When we look at the original language, whenever you see the English word in our Bibles for praise, in the original Hebrew, that word replaces to confess, give thanks, play a musical instrument, to boast about. And in the New Testament, in the Greek and Aramaic, it replaces words or phrases like to speak well of, to commend, and to glorify. When you give praise to a child, you are commending them for doing something, whether that's putting away clothes, whether that's eating all the food on their dish, whether that's uh, sharing toys. Praise is based in truth. Someone has done something and you acknowledge what they have done by giving them praise. You do not praise someone if they have done nothing. And that's why it is based in truth. The truth is that they have done something and you've witnessed that or the evidence of them having done that is available. Like you might not see God heal someone at the exact moment that he heals someone, but you see the evidence of that by that person no longer dealing with whatever he's healed them from. So he's deserving of that praise. There are 250 statements in the Old and New Testament that command or declare praise to God. And if there is a praise book in the Bible, that would be Psalms. Psalms. Let's turn to Psalms chapter 148 today. We're going to read, read through this chapter here. Um, we have a lot, of, a lot of commands there. This one meets a lot of that 250 commands throughout the Bible. But Psalm 148, it says, Praise the Lord. That's a good way to start out. Praise the Lord from the heavens, praise him from the skies, praise him, all his angels, praise him, all the armies of heaven, praise him, sun and moon, praise him, all you twinkly stars, praise him, skies above, praise him, vapors high above the clouds. Let every created thing give praise to the Lord, for he issued his command and they came into being. He is the life giver. He set them in place forever and ever. His decree will never be revoked. Praise the Lord from the earth, you creatures of the ocean depths. Fire and hail, snow and clouds, wind and weather that obey him, mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, even the bad ones, wild animals and all livestock, small scurrying animals and birds, kings of the earth and all the people, rulers and judges of the earth, young men and young women, old men and children, let them all praise the name of the Lord. For his name is very great. His glory towers over the earth and heaven. He has made his people strong, honoring his faithful ones. The people of Israel who are close to him, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. If he was worthy of our praise 3,000 years ago, he is still worthy of our praise today. The reason that people were praising God two to 3,000 years ago, that's still a reason, that exact same reason we can praise him today. And... And this is the thing about praise. Um, it, it just can, for God, it just continues to pile up. I have these Legos here. Uh, the kids' church, they were not able to play with Legos before church this morning because I am borrowing them. But let's say every piece of these Legos... Should I dump it over there too, Pastor Ken? Okay. Uh, <laughs> but this, this pile of Legos are reasons to praise God. Like God created the heavens and the earth. God created humanity. God sustains life. All of these reasons are there. And guess what? No matter where you go out and do whatever and deal with that, whatever cedar allergies, you deal with relationship troubles, you deal with financial troubles, that doesn't change that pile. God has still done those things. And like Pastor Ken was saying earlier today, because you're dealing with these other things, there's a time to stop focusing on that and focus on the pile for what God has done. And guess what? I'm getting a little fired today, just so you guys know. But guess what? They had reasons to praise God two to 3,000 years ago, but God has given us a lot more reason to praise him this morning. And that doesn't change. So God is worthy of our praise and praise is based in truth. Now here's the thing. Christians and non-Christians 
are able to praise God because both are able to see the evidence of what God has done. I think an example of this in our modern world uh, would be Jordan Peterson. Um, for those of you that, that know him, he is not a Christian. He is not serving the Lord, but it's interesting. Uh, I've just been kind of following along with him. He's slowly inching to coming to Jesus as he has this curiosity about Christianity. But uh, he says, I act as if God exists and I'm terrified that he might, is one of his quotes there, which seems to be God's spirit kind of bringing conviction on him. But you can find plenty of videos of him praising God and, and, and those that serve him for what they're trying to do for him as well. And so I think the best example showing that Christians and non-Christians alike can praise God is Philippians 2, 9 through 11. Uh, this one's not on the screen, but it says, Therefore God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names. That at the ne name of Jesus, and this is because Jesus humbled himself, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue declare, every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every knee will bow and declare Jesus the Lord and everyone will praise him in this fashion. So non-Christians can give praise to God because the praise of God is based on what God has already done and Christians and non-Christians see that evidence. But that is not the case for worship. Non-Christians are not able to truly worship God. The worship of God begins inside you. Jesus, speaking to the woman at the well, uh, he, he's countering the statement she made saying, well, us Samaritans, we, we, we worship at Mount Gersim, but you Jews, you worship in Jerusalem. And Jesus says this in John 4, 23, but the time is coming, indeed it's here now, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him that way. For God is spirit, so those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. But the time is coming, indeed it's here. This is Jesus speaking about himself. When it comes to worshiping in spirit, if you are not a Christian, you do not have the Lord's spirit dwelling inside you, so you're not able to worship in spirit. And if you are not a Christian, you have not accepted the truth, which means you are not able to worship in truth. And what is the truth? that we are all sinners. We are not able to escape from our sins ourselves. So God sent his son to die on the cross for us so we could be made free of sin and death and enter into the presence of God to worship him, having been made clean and righteous through the blood of Jesus. If people have not accepted that truth, which means they haven't applied it to their lives, which means they haven't turned to Jesus, then they're not able to worship him in that truth. Without the spirit and without the truth, True worship doesn't happen, but it takes even more than that. It also takes sacrifice and it also takes surrender to truly worship God. And this is why the second reason people can't worship God is because they're already worshiping something else. They've already surrendered, they've already sacrificed themselves to something else, whether that's a hobby, a relationship, money, or even themselves. Paul says in Romans chapter 12, 1 through 2, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Some people, they go to church to worship God, but they don't worship. They may be given a ton of praise, but the worship of God is non-existent because they haven't given their bodies to God, letting them be a living and holy sacrifice for him. Now, this passage is not saying, okay, okay, giving my body to God, what does that mean? Do I have to become a martyr in order to truly worship God? Do I have to uh, spill my own blood to truly worship God? That's not what it's saying there. When you look at the original language, what's being said there, Paul is saying to give your whole self over to God to truly worship him. Your mind, your soul, your spirit, your body. That is what is being communicated right there. That in everything that you do, you worship God. In everything. Not just when you come in here singing on Sunday mornings. 
And that is why worship for one person, you know, if you're in your pew, it can look like this, just singing on Sunday mornings. For another person, it can be arms raised. For another person, it can be kneeling, arms raised. For another person, worship can look like this. Worship can look like this. Worship can look like all these different things because worship isn't just Sunday mornings for us. But you're worshiping God way before you come in here and enter these doors to sing the songs that we sing on Sunday morning. You're worshiping God by the way you live your lives. You're worshiping God by the way you interact with one another. You're worshiping God by how you relax, by how you play, by how you uh, handle business. You are worshiping God, okay? And this is also why if you look at someone who... uh, you know, maybe they're, they're bowing down, they're crying out to the Lord, uh, their arms are raised, might not have a better worship life than someone who's just standing in their pews worshiping. Because someone who is bowing down, who's crying, who, crying out to the Lord on Sunday mornings might be living for the world throughout the rest of the week. But the someone standing behind in the pew might have given their life to God throughout the week and everything that they do, they are worshiping God. And so that is something else to keep in mind. So worship is not just Sunday mornings from, what time, 11 o'clock? Uh, from 11 to, no wait, excuse me, 10 to 10.45, sorry. <laughs> sorry. 10 to 10.45-ish, around there. That's not what worship is. Worship extends far beyond that in each one of our lives. And so with all that said, why then, do we, uh, why then do we raise our hands? Why then do some, some people bow when we worship? Well, we, we see examples of this throughout scripture. It says in Psalms 132, 2, lift your hands towards the sanctuary and praise the Lord, like you're reaching out to the Lord. In Psalm 141, 1 through 2, it says, O Lord, I am calling to you, please hurry. Listen when I cry to you for help. Accept my prayers as incense offered to you and my upraised hands as an evening offering. So lifting our hands up as an offering to the Lord in Psalm 141. In Psalm 63, it says, I will praise you as long as I live, lifting my hands to you in prayer. Um, Sean Holden, who just took off, so I can't like see his face. But Sean Holden, he brought this up a few months ago um, because we were talking about worship. And he's saying, you know, when you're, you're, you're arrested and, I don't know, maybe you're a violent criminal or something, uh, and the cops, they got you at gunpoint, what do they tell you to do? Put your hands in the air. Because this is the universal sign of surrender. And so that's something to think about when worship, the true form of worship, is us surrendering to God. So what about bowing? Bowing, Nehemiah chapter eight, verse six, we see an example here. Then Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people chanted, amen, amen, as they lifted their hands. Then they bowed down and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Now, when we come to worship the Lord and we're thinking about bowing here, uh, we know that when we are in the presence of earthly kings or queens, we're out of respect, we're supposed to bow, correct? How much more should we bow in the presence of, of the heavenly king, of the king of kings, of the Lord of lords. That's just something to think about there. And I know, I know some of you in here, you're thinking, man, I, I grew up Lutheran. I grew up down here, it's Baptist. I grew up Baptist. I grew up Catholic. I'm not used to these outward form, outward expressions of worship. Uh, I, I don't, you know, I keep I keep uh, being surprised. Some people don't know that we are a Pentecostal church. <laughs> uh, what we had this morning here, this message in tongues, that's what Pentecostal churches do. Uh, that's why you see people raising their hands in worship because we're a Pentecostal church. How many of you know that King David was Pentecostal? He was Pentecostal. Second Samuel chapter 6, verse 14, King David, uh, he is celebrating because the Ark of the Covenant is being returned from the Philistines and, and the Ark of the Covenant is coming throughout Jerusalem. And it says, and David danced before the Lord with all his might, wearing a priestly garment. And, and you go a few verses later, um, his wife, Michael, seems to indicate that David was pretty exposed, you know, wearing these priestly garments. Just a few verses later, and that was David celebrating and worshiping God. 
dancing, singing, and wearing a priestly garment, and possibly nothing else. I know it's hard to indicate what's going on there, but David, <laughs> that's Pentecostal if I ever heard one, you know? That's, a, that's the far end of Pentecostal. Uh, if you do that here, you know, Pastor Kenny's going to call security, okay? So don't, don't do that here. But David was definitely Pentecostal, and, and in this account, uh, part of that worship for him included dancing. But as we talk about raising our hands or bowing down in worship today, you may be hearing this and you're thinking, you know, I'll, I'll never do that. Uh, that's too embarrassing. That's too, that's too humbling. But that might be exactly what you need to be able to take your praise and worship of God to the next level. Maybe you need to humble yourself before the Lord and your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ in order to encounter God like you never have before. You know, going back to David and him responding to his wife, Michael, about dancing in the priestly garment, uh, he says in 2 Samuel 6, 21, I was dancing before the Lord who chose me above your father and all his family. That's, always, that's a snap back there. But uh, he appointed me as the leader of Israel and the people of the Lord, so I celebrate before the Lord. In verse 22, Yes, I am willing to look even more foolish than this, even to be humiliated in my own eyes. But those servant girls you mentioned will indeed think I'm distinguished. I'm willing to be, look more foolish and be humiliated in my own eyes. He was willing to look, be more humiliated for the Lord. And he was called a man after God's own heart. Sometimes it takes ourselves, humbling ourselves to get to that next level of worshiping God. Uh, that all said, this morning we, man, this is a short message. I kind of got through it quick. Uh, I'm going to, and no amens, okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call the worship team up to the front, but as they're coming up to the front, I want to leave you with a final thought here. Because we're, we're doing something a little different today. We're going to end in worship. You know, we're going to end in what we're going to be doing for eternity in the presence of God once we get to heaven. But I want to remind us all of how much of an honor it is to enter into the presence of God for worship. It is something that we should not take lightly at all. When we get to enter into the worship of the creator of the universe, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. It's an honor provided to us by Jesus so that every individual in here can enter into the presence. And it's a big deal. Uh, such a big deal that we see that people in the Old Testament, when they entered into worship of God incorrectly, they were put to death. In the Old Testament, the way they entered into God's presence to worship is different than the way we do today. For them, their middlemen were, were the priests, were the Levites that came and took their sacrifices for worship and offered it to God. For us today, our middleman is Jesus. He is the one who not only takes our offering of praise and worship to God, but he brings us with him into the presence of God to worship him. And not only that, he becomes our offering to God on our behalf. And that's why it's different for us. But in the Old Testament, we have this account found in Leviticus chapter 10 of Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, who doing a form of worship for them back then, which was burning incense, uh, they were burning the wrong kind of fire. Or in essence, they were worshiping God incorrectly in a way that he commanded them not to worship him. And they were consumed by fire, meaning that God sent fire to destroy them. God's holiness is so great that it destroys unholiness. Now, we today, we don't have to worry about approaching God in the wrong way like Nadab and Abihu did because Jesus took care of that for us already. So we don't have to worry about that. But this should be a reminder for us how much we really don't deserve to enter into the presence of God. But also a reminder of how much God loves us because even though we don't deserve it, he still provided the way for it through Jesus Christ. And so this morning, you should have plenty of energy still because we're early. <laughs> but I encourage you, uh, we're going to close out the service here with another worship song. Um, I encourage you to try something you, haven't, you don't normally do when it comes to worship. Whether that's an external expression of surrender or an internal spiritual one, I encourage you to dig into 
what God has done for you, all the many, many reasons to give him praise. I encourage you to surrender to him. I encourage you to put away the things that you might be worshiping instead of him so that you can have a true time of worship for him this morning. So let's all stand today and close out today in worship. I stand
Lord, we just come to you this morning and we thank you for the opportunity to enter into presence, in your presence, Lord. And, and we remember that you are the one that provided the way for us to, to worship you. And so, Lord, we thank you for sending your son to die on the cross for us, to give us the opportunity to have that relationship with you where we are cleansed from on our, our unrighteousness so that we can be in your presence. We thank you, Lord, that no matter where we are at, whether we're here at HCC, whether we're driving down the road, uh, whether we're at work or wherever, that we can be in your presence and worship you, and that we are, Lord. And so this morning I pray that each one in here is, as we worship you with our voices today, that we are reminded that worship encompasses every part of our life, no matter what we do. Let me just give you praise this morning, Lord. Let me say these things in your name. Amen. Well, we're, we're done singing for this morning, but you're not done worshiping. Uh, as you leave this church today and you're driving down the road and that driver cuts you off and you pull up a little bit further and you see they're on their cell phone, you're worshiping God then. Or when you get home and your parents or your spouse or your kids, they want to do something with you and you just want to take your Sunday afternoon nap, your reaction to that is worship to God. And so this morning... As you're being dismissed, remember you're not dismissed from the presence of God. You're just dismissed from this building. And I have one last question to leave with you as you go. Uh, this one comes from Pastor Joy. But if you were to take out the worship team on Sunday mornings, their instruments, the songs being sung, our worship time we have here, what would your worship life look like? It should not cease to exist if this did not happen on Sunday mornings. And so examine yourselves. And with all that said, you are dismissed from this building, but not from the presence of the Lord. Have a great Sunday. Thank you.